And we've been going through, uh, for the last few weeks, um, chapters of the new book. I happen to have a test copy right here. Test copy. <laughs> See, it's got this, this bar right across it that says not for resale. <laughs> it's, it's just a proof copy right now, but that's sort of what it'll look like eventually. And uh, it's coming out uh, November 7th, I think, is going to be the date that we've set um, for the actual launch. So it's coming up soon. And uh, we've been trying to go through just various chapters to get a sense of what's happening in the book. But the book is set up so that the main 12 chapters, called Challenges, are looking at issues that we face every single day. And is there a way, just as Jesus showed us, to turn them around, look at them from the other side, and get a completely different message that actually can propel us through life in, in a much more kingdom-centered way. And that's the whole point of this. Um, last week, we talked about Scripture. We talked about inspiration of Scripture. And uh, I kind of wanted to continue that. Uh, I felt like we just got started with that huge subject uh, and needed a little bit more talk here. Um, because, you know, the Quran... I'm familiar with the Quran, the, the uh, sacred book of, of Islam. In the Quran, the Muslims call Jews and Christians the people of the book. Did you know that? We are designated as the people of the book. And if you think about it, that's a pretty good description, both for, for Jews and for Christians. Because we believe that everything that we know about God is contained in the book, especially since the Protestant Reformation, where that was kind of taken up to an art form. In the first 1,500 years of Christianity, at least there was a sense that there was a combination of tradition and scripture and a personal revelation in, in the form of contem contemplative mysticism and so on and so forth. But after the reservation, res Reformation, off the reservation, after the Reformation in the West, uh, it was sola scriptura, only scripture, uh, was the revelation of God. And so we've gotten more and more hyper-focused on the words of scripture understood from an intellectual point of view. And so here we are. We are depending on the book. We are depending on everything that we know about, the, the, about God to come from the words of scripture. So when Christians disagree... And when has there been a time when Christians didn't disagree? Christians are always disagreeing. What we're really disagreeing about is what we believe about the book. Not so much about what we believe about God, but what we believe about the book, because the book is what tells us about God. And what we believe about God is changed by the way that we look at the book and what we believe about the book. And so this is what we have to take a look at when we are just looking at the words of Scripture, we are disagreeing about everything. Everything is being interpreted differently. Everything is coming into a different frame of reference. But when we move into contemplative practice, when we get the mind out of the way and we just be heart to heart in presence with God, the message becomes one. It is so interesting to see that 2,000 years of a contemplative or even mystical tradition has given us a uniform view of who God is, that God really is love. God really is presence and unity. Everything really will be well. That is the consistent message that we get from a presence, unitive point of view, but from a scripture-based intellectual point of view, we're all over the map. I heard a recent statistic that there's something like 50,000 different Christian denominations. I don't know if that's inflated. A few years ago, I heard it was 30,000. So 20,000 came out of the corner here someplace. I don't know. But there's a lot of them. And every one of those is founded on a different view of the book. And so people of the book, this is what we need to take a look at and see what is it about this book and how can we approach this book in a way that the words and our experience begin to match up. That's the key here. Now, last week, I professed my love for the book to you all. I made it public. You know, I love this book. I've been studying this book for 30 years. But like any relationship, it was really hard at the beginning. You know, It was really hard 
this book just wouldn't lay down and be what I wanted it to be. This book defied any of my attempts to remake it in my own image. And so we struggled. We beat heads. I was at the end of my rope at times, just completely frustrated. And it seemed like, you know, the more I studied and the more that I tried to understand, the more voices that I listened to, the more that I was just lost. You ever get that, that, that experience where you listen to all these different voices and you don't even know what you're hearing anymore? Everybody's saying something different and they're saying it really loud and really absolutely. And it's like, who's right? What's going on here? The relationship was really hard at first until I found a way to come to terms with the book, with my relationship with the book in a very special way. And that was the key. This book is not like any other book that I've read, and it's not going to be like any other book that you've read if you really want to enter into a relationship with it. Like last week, we talked about this book is more like music in which the printed page of music manuscript is not the music itself. It's sort of the bridge between the sounds in the composer's mind and the sounds coming out of the fingers and pipes of the, of the gifted performer. It's a bridge between the two. Music is meant to be played, not to be looked at or read. The Bible is meant to be played, not just read or looked at. This was a huge difference that it took me years to figure out because there was really nobody in my corner telling me about this. Everybody was talking about the written word and studying it and understanding it just right, getting the right interpretation so that we were in God's camp. We were one with God. It was dependent upon that intellectual understanding. But here is this other experience. The word is meant to be played. The word is meant to be performed, if you want to look at it that way. I think I've told this story in here before, but when I was in college, I was a, a lit and creative uh, writing major. And so we had whole uh, semesters on certain authors, whole semester on Faulkner and whole semester on, on Hemingway, whole semester on North American poets, and a whole semester on Shakespeare. And so here I am sitting and trying to read Shakespearean plays, and it is just not getting through. You know, all the, the Middle English and, and all of the, the strange idioms and phraseology, it was just not happening. So I went into one of the labs, and I found a recording of one of the plays, and I played that recording and listened to it, and the whole thing just came alive. It's like I understood every word from the actor's lips, the way they inflected it, the emotion that they put into it, the interplay between the characters suddenly came alive. And I realized it's a play. It's not meant to be read. It's meant to be performed. And in the performance, we get what is really going on. It was so long for me to, to make this shift, again, because I didn't have anyone telling me that there is or there was another acceptable way to look at Scripture. And in my frustration, I started looking in all different sorts of areas, trying to find something that made sense to me. And I remember finding an American Catholic church, and uh, I, I just drove out there and uh, <laughs> sort of hijacked the priest. I still remember his name, Father Erskine. And uh, he dutifully sat down with me in his office and talked to me. And after, I don't know how long it was, half an hour, 45 minutes of me pouring all this stuff out, he finally says, how much time you got? And I said, I got time. He says, want to take a ride? Sure. And we got in my car, and he directed me to a Catholic bookstore in Costa Mesa and just started pointing at uh, book jackets, and I just picked anything up that he pointed at, walked out with over $100 worth of books, which in the early 90s was a lot of dough, right? And I was introduced to people like Merton, people like Nowen, people like Brennan Manning, people like Augustine, people like the mystics coming from a completely different point of view. See, the mystics and the contemplatives among us are the performers. They are the ones who are living this out. They are the ones who are moving into the space that the Bible is trying to create for us if we really understand the method behind the Hebrew writings that are there. And so finally, I started reading these things, and I started understanding that there was not one monolithic way to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, but there was this other way. And I want to read you a little bit from Thomas Merton, who was so formative for me. And he actually has a book called Opening the Bible. 
It, it's, it's nothing more than really a, a sort of a, a published essay in a cover. I mean, the thing is that skinny, but it is, is profound in what it has. And just, just listen to this. What kind of book is this? And of course, he's talking about the Bible. What kind of book is this? Such a question cannot be answered without taking into account the very peculiar claims that have been made for the Bible by Christian, Jewish, and even Muslim believers, claims which, to many modern men, are outrageous, claims that this book is unlike any other and that man's very destiny depends on it. We cannot understand anything about the Bible unless we face the fact that these claims are made seriously and that the outrage taken at them is also fully serious. Neither can be discounted. It is of the very nature of the Bible to affront, perplex, and astonish the human mind. You get that? It's the very nature of the Bible to affront, perplex, and astonish the human mind. Have you ever felt like that when you're reading the Bible, especially early on? Try to remember back before you got familiar with it. What was happening was just hitting you in the face, perplexing, outrageous, astonishing. How am I supposed to understand this? How am I supposed to take this? What does this even mean? How can this possibly be? All the questions that come up. Hence, the reader who opens the Bible must be prepared for disorientation, confusion, incomprehension, and perhaps outrage. I think that about sums it up for me. I mean, that's what I was feeling back then. I was trying so hard to understand. The Bible is, without question, one of the most unsatisfying books ever written. <laughs> at least, at least, until the reader has come to terms with it in a very special way. But it's a difficult book to come to terms with. Far easier, perhaps, if one just pretends that the question is all settled in advance. One hears from others that it's a sacred book, takes their word for it, and resolves not to get involved. I love that. Resolves not to get involved. What does that look like, not to get involved with the Bible? Well, not to look too long at it. Just kind of skim, bounce, and, and just things you don't understand. You kind of just move on to the next. Kind of like a word that you don't know the definition. You kind of try to understand in context and, and move on, you know, hard. Don't look hard. Don't look too long. Don't ask the obvious questions. And don't worry over the half answers that you get or the non-answers that you get when you do ask certain questions. In other words, you just have to kind of hover over the surface and not really dig down. Take things for granted. Move on. Don't get too involved in it because it just doesn't make sense and there doesn't seem to be anyone coming to the rescue to help. Or you can just completely dismiss it if that's what you want to do. But the Bible raises the question of identity in a way no other book does. Absolutely true. As Karl Barth pointed out, and Karl Barth, famous Swiss Reformed theologian of the early 20th century, as Karl Barth pointed out, when you begin to question the Bible, you find that the Bible is also questioning you. When you ask, what is this book? You find that you are also implicitly being asked, who is this who reads it? See, this is the, the genius of the Bible, that it lives in a different space if we will allow it to. Now, Karl Barth is an interesting figure. He is one of the greatest theologians of, of Christianity of, of any century, uh, but he happens to be uh, in the 20th century. He died in 1968. And he was Swiss Reformed, which means he was Calvinist, and he was one of the founders of the Neo-Orthodox movement in the first half of the 20th century. And what was that all about? Theology had moved so far to humanism and feelings and social justice and these sorts of, of concepts in the late 19th century, in the late 1800s, neo-Orthodoxy was trying to pull it back. They wanted it to be more rooted on the tenets of the Reformation 500 years before, but also they wanted it to be rooted in the Bible's teaching. They wanted it to be right back to the, the core of everything, the core of the understanding of the word. But here's the, uh, the interesting thing about Karl Barth. Even though he was a founder of that movement, even though that was his goal, as he got into the Bible, he got involved. 
He wasn't just skimming, or he wasn't just looking to uh, confirm what he already thought he knew. He let the Bible do this work on him. That's why he says, when you begin to question the Bible, you, a- you find that the Bible is questioning you. When you ask, what is this book? Who is this who reads this book? Barth said that actually building a relationship with the Bible was walking into, moving into a strange new world within the Bible. He called it a strange new world, something that didn't comport with the way that the world works or the way that we think it should work or what we think we know. And yet, if we're taking the Bible seriously, then we have to start to assume at some point, if we're going to, that that strange new world is the real world and not the familiar world that we know or think we know and are clinging on to for support. That shift has to happen where we allow the Bible to start showing us a different reality, a different way of understanding to go someplace completely unexpected and be happy about it. That's a huge shift, this strange new world. Ever heard of Flannery O'Connor? She was a famous uh, novelist also in the early 20th century. And uh, she said that, I like Barth. I like Carl Barth. He's not afraid to throw the furniture around. (laughs) Think about that. He's not afraid to throw the furniture around. He's not afraid to... First of all, get involved with the Bible. Let it take him somewhere he didn't expect. And then to actually put his name to the writing down of that expression, of that experience. Amazing. Amazing. Also amazing is that Pope Pius the 12th, I believe, in 1951. Now, first of all, is the Pope Catholic? Pope Pius says of Karl Barth, a Swiss Reformed Protestant theologian, that he is the greatest theologian since Aquinas. Pope Pius said that. Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, was born just a year before Francis of Assisi died, also in Italy. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians in all of Christianity, and Pius says that Barth is the greatest since him. Now, what is it about Aquinas that connects the two? Interesting. Aquinas was this absolute genius intellect. It's just hard to imagine a mind like, that works like his. Many books written, but his summa is the Summa Theologica. And this is the, 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 the core, the, 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 the pinnacle of medieval theology. It is a massive work. He did it right up to the time of his death. If you buy it right now, it's going to be 22 volumes and it's going to contain over 7,000 pages. I want to read you just a little blurb here. Thomas Aquinas stands among the most important thinkers in the history of Christianity, and his famous Summa Theologica represents the pinnacle of medieval theology and perhaps the most influential theological work in the history of Western Christianity. That's a mouthful, but they're not done yet. In the volumes of his writings, we find the forerunners of every intellectual development in the eight centuries that have followed. And the depth of his understanding of the nature and being of God has left a lasting mark on the enterprise of Christian theological reflection ever since. Wow. But the Summa Theological was never finished. And do you know why? At the end of his life, and he died when he was only 49 years old, just a year before he died, he had a series of mystical visions. One of them, someone just caught him standing in the chapel looking at a stained glass image of Jesus. And just in this reverie, and of course the legend is he was actually levitating as he was just in this this ecstatic reverie. And then a few days later, he was saying mass, and he went into another reverie. That must have been uncomfortable. All of a sudden, he's just stopped. And you're waiting for the Mass to continue. But he was in this long reverie. And after that, he stopped writing. He was still, he was right up there. He was working right up to those 7,000 pages. And after those visions, he stopped writing. And his friend begged him to start working again. And he said, I cannot. Everything that I've written just seems as straw to me. What did I just read? (laughs) 
the most influential theological work in the history of Western Christianity, and it seems a straw to him. What happened to these men? What happened to Merton? What happened to Barth? What happened to Aquinas? What switched in them that everything that they thought that they were about changed? What seemed important to them suddenly was straw, that he didn't even finish the work that he had been laboring on so greatly. Coming back to Merton, in the progress toward religious understanding, one does not go from answer to answer, but from question to question. One's questions are answered not by clear, definitive answers, but by more pertinent and more crucial questions. In the case of the Zen master and his disciple, the disciple asked a general, abstract, doctrinal question, one which could admit any amount of theoretical elaboration. But the master replies with a direct, existential, concrete question to which there is no theological, theoretical answer and which no amount of verbalizing will be able to penetrate. It has to be grappled with in an entirely different way. The same is true of the Bible. If we approach it with speculative questions, we are apt to find that it confronts us in turn with brutally practical questions. If we ask it for information about the meaning of life, it answers by asking when we intend to start living. I love that. If we really are going to enter into a conversation with the Bible, that conversation isn't going to go where we expect it to go. Does any conversation ever really go where you expect it to go with another person, especially the ones that you plan out? They never go that way. Why would you think a conversation with the living, breathing word of God is going to be any different? It's going to go in completely different directions. There's going to be someone else pulling on the, si on the other end of that rope. There's going to be a volley back when you hit the ball over the net. This isn't static. This isn't stayed. This isn't something that you can just understand statically for all time. It's going to be an actual conversation. This is what we're up against when we're trying to understand how to approach the Bible, how we do this. Like any real conversation, it's going to have a life on its own. It's going to take us into that strange new world that if we really do believe the book, it's going to force us to consider that that world is the real one and not the familiar world that we know. And if we have faith, defined Hebraically as action, not more belief, then we're going to start to live as if that world really were true. We're going to make our decisions and our choices based on that. See, I vividly remember the moment that I hit the same wall that we're talking about this wall with the book and with church. And I wrote about it, and I want to read you this journal entry because it, it carries a, sort of in a muted way the emotional content. It's hard for me now even to remember the turmoil that I was in when all this was going on in 1994. This was 25 years ago. Now, from this vantage point and so much of the healing that has taken place in me personally, it's hard to remember how torn up I was, how messed up I was. And this is, is muted, but maybe it'll help to get you into the more of the emotional framework of what really happens when you let the Bible in, when you let it really do its work on you. On Wednesday, March 3rd, 1994, at 11.35 a.m., and yes, I am OCD. I have, become, I have begun working with a client, a psychologist, who is very Eastern in her thought and spirituality. She comes at a time in my life as I grow more dissatisfied with the practice of Christianity with the way it is practiced here in Orange County, in California, with the closed-mindedness, legalism, contradictions, hypocrisies, absurdities. Well, that's a lot of judgment for me, isn't it? You know? But this is how alienated I was feeling from everything. You know? Maybe those weren't really fair criticisms to be leveled, at least at the church that I was in, but it's how I was feeling about it because I was so ripped up. This client comes at a time when Merton and Augustine have been breaking open great airy places in my heart, places where I've come to realize that although the words are clear, who you are, Lord, is not. Who are you really? The I am. What does that mean? 
the eternal self-existence. What is that? There are no words for you. There aren't even any thoughts for you that can be entertained directly in our minds. Who is God? This question keeps coming back over and over, and not just with me, but with anyone who really wants to take their spirituality seriously. Lord, we can't look you in the face. We approach obliquely. We know you only through the glass darkly. I know why most Christians, most people, stop at such a superficial level. How do you deal with that which is beneath language, beneath rational thought, outside of physics? The word is clear. Stick to that. Order your life around it. Cling to the salvation promise by clinging to the letter of the word, thereby circumventing any deeper questions. And none of this is wrong, unless it leads to self-righteousness, but it is incomplete. But how complete can our relationship with you be in this life, Lord? I don't know, but certainly more than I generally see around me. Again, I see that you are nothing that I have imagined, nothing I can imagine, but I have to keep trying to understand. This woman comes to me at this time of questioning when I am pulling on myself in the midst of turmoil and says that Christianity won't be able to contain me very long, that I will advance beyond it. And I ask rhetorically how Christianity is being defined because I've already outgrown, or better, moved past the superficiality that abounds in media and literature as the fullest expression of my personal faith. Catholicism, stripped of its government and catechism, beckons with its deep and ancient mystical roots. Zen beckons as a pure attempt to approach truth by eliminating all that is untrue. And flailing away at all of this, I've been steadily giving ground until I am backed flat against the wall of my absolutes. But with these words, these questions, I feel that wall giving way also, open me up to 360 degrees of confrontation or freedom. What do I believe? Who do I believe right now that you are, Lord? I was kind of an excitable boy back then. This was sort of a climax. This was the, the end of my ability to understand. I had been trying so hard to understand these things, the teachings of the church, the words of scripture, and all those voices that I was hearing on the radio and everywhere else trying to fit it, trying to make it work. And I was to the end of that, the end of the understanding, at least rationally speaking. I knew I needed a completely different approach and that thinking wouldn't take me where I really wanted to go. Francis of Assisi was overheard praying all night long, one line, who are you, my Lord? Who are you, my Lord, and who am I? Who are you, my Lord, who am I? Over and over, hitting that same place. Who are you, Lord, who am I? That question of identity, both of our God, of absolute reality, and ourselves in relation to that. Who are you, Lord, and who am I? In the absence of full understanding, I have to take a stand. This is me, 25 years ago. I must have a point from which to strike out into deeper relationship. I believe you are love, Father. I believe you when you said you'd never leave or forsake. I drive a stake in the ground at the point of your love. Your love that can't be altered or attenuated by you or anything I or anyone else can do or fail to do. And revolving around that stake like an orbit of ever-widening circles, I'll interpret everything I encounter in the light of your love and not the other way around. Whether considering your word, the scriptures that comprise our Bible, a personal tragedy, the world's cruelty, or a friend's requests, I'll negotiate as best I can with one hand grasping that stake. To let go of your love as the center of all gravity is to hopelessly lose my way. This is a stand that I can take, and from it flows a direction, a walk. I still don't know who you are, Lord. You're a moving target full of surprises. Your revelations come at the most unexpected places. Your truth permeates all corners of the universe, all walks of life, all philosophies, religions, codes. But it is here that I find you most fully, 
with my back against the solidity of your promise. In my weakness, I pray for your indulgence and guidance, and I pray you will never allow me to become so lazy, comfortable, smug, or complacent as to fail to recognize your truth wherever I find it or to tear away at the structures I have built in my mind and life. When it becomes obvious, they can no longer contain the God you have revealed yourself to be. Now, I'm no Francis, I'm no Aquinas, Barth, or Merton, but I share this experience with them. I know what it is they're trying to say. I came to the end of what I could understand. But instead of an ending, what it turned out to be was a new beginning in the sense of the beginning of a different view of spirituality, a different way of approaching the whole thing. It was the beginning of a graduation from mental ideas, mere mental ascent, to a direct connection. With that stake in the ground, I could stop worrying over everything that I couldn't answer. Do you know what a relief that was? Not to have to worry about what I couldn't answer, what I couldn't understand. That was just driving me nuts, driving me crazy. It was an obsessive need to try to figure it out. But with my hand grasping the stake of the Father's love, I could stop worrying about that. I could stop listening to every single voice and seeking out new voices that would probably hopefully give me the next thing that I needed, the next bit of understanding, I could just stop. I could stop all the debate and the controversy of theology in my mind or engaging in it with others, and I could stop living in all of that fear. It didn't happen overnight, but that was the beginning of moving in a new direction. To begin living what I was convinced of, the Father's love, and to see if it actually started to change me, started to heal me. And it did, but not overnight. See, I think this is exactly what Paul is trying to tell us, what he's driving at in 1 Corinthians 3. Take a look at that. It's, it's in your uh, inserts. And if Brandon is on it, it's already up on the screens. 1 Corinthians 3, starting right at verse 1. I'm going to read it out of the... Uh, ESV version, English Standard, but you're going to see it in NASB, so it'll be a little bit different. Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as a spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Okay, so he's dressing down his people right now, at least the, the, the church at Corinth. I can't address you as spiritual people but as people of the flesh. Now, flesh sounds a little weird to us, you know, the word there, but what he's really talking about is people who are still captives of the egoic mind. That's the way we put it in here. Still slaves to everything that our minds are telling us and all the, the images and all of the conceptions of ourselves and our relationships and everything, that familiar world, they're still captive to that. I can't address you as spiritual people, but people of the flesh, as still infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not yet ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. Now, what's going on here? Remember, reading the epistles, their letters, it's always like a Jeopardy game. We're getting the answers and not the questions, right? He's reacting to something. What the heck is going on? Well, he told us two chapters before at 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, which would be Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See what he's getting at? The people were divided. They were listening to every one of these teachers. Apollos was a, a, was a surrogate of Paul. He stayed behind when Paul moved on to the next church and was teaching the people, and they started listening to him. But Paul and Apollos represented the Greek faction of the, of the followers of Jesus. Peter was part of the Jewish side, and there was a difference in understanding of what needed to go on. It was a big fight in the first decades after the crucifixion. And so these people are falling into different camps, and they're fighting with each other. And, you know, they're, they're, they're grabbing on. They're building tribes. It's like a sports team. You know, they're, they got their tribe, and it's against that tribe, and they're fighting. Does any of this sound familiar to you? I mean, it was ever thus. It's still that way now. This is what he's dealing with. People, Paul is trying to get the people to graduate from just passively listening to a teacher, grabbing on to the truth du jour, the truth that they think is, is most facile and easiest for them to digest, and then creating a faction, joining a club, basically. He's trying to get them to graduate from that kind of mentality and moving in to the end of understanding, to let that understanding go, to let go of leaning on that understanding so that they can move into the deeper walk, no longer infants in their journey but becoming mature. And then Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. There it is a thousand years before. Same idea, that same timeless idea that our minds are only going to take us so far and then we have to let go if we want to get to the next level. There's a much deeper place beyond all of this, if we can let go of our partial understanding, realize that any partial understanding that we can muster is only going to take us so far, and that will change everything. It's hard to imagine the impact that making this shift will have on you, and the only thing that I could come up with as a possible metaphor how many of you remember when we landed on the moon? That's getting back there. 1969, right? But you still probably remember it. But what you probably remember more, because it's been an icon since, was when those astronauts first saw Earth rise over the desolate moon surface for the first time. To see our planet, the entire thing, hanging in space like a blue marble, changed fundamentally the way that we looked at ourselves as a species, looked at our whole biosphere. We have always been standing on the surface of the Earth. Or if we get up into air in an airplane, we, we can maybe see the curvature of the Earth. But this was the first time we saw the whole thing just hanging in blackness like that and rising like the moon rises over the surface. That changed our viewpoint who we are, what our relationship is to our world, what our world's relationship is to the solar system and the universe. Everything changed fundamentally. Now, I think we've kind of lost that. You know, we're back on the surface of the Earth again. But there was that brief time where that image coalesced into a fundamental shift in cosmology and, and just existential reality, if you want to look at it that way. This is the kind of shift that can happen in us when we can make this change. Changing everything. Breaking out of the mind's death grip and seeing ourselves hanging in space. Seeing ourselves as related to God's spirit. See that connection. It can have the same, ex same effect on us. Absolutely, fundamentally life-changing. And Paul tries to express it to these fighting Corinthians, right? Here's the famous chapter, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. You probably heard it at a dozen wedding ceremonies, but listen to it again from the point of view that we're talking about right now. Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We know that. We've heard that before. And it sounds sweet, almost saccharine. But now take it back into the context that we're talking about right now. See how it changes. Now we know in part. We can only prophesy in part. Everything is as seen through the glass dimly, darkly. There's only so much that we can understand. And we think that we're talking about death when we break through and we can see face to face. But from a contemplative point of view, there is a breakthrough that happens in life as well, where we finally break through the stranglehold of our minds wanting to understand and delineate and differentiate and put everything under glass. And we just can be face to face, heart to heart, and everything changes. It's not about what we can say or understand or do. It's only about the presence to love. That's where Paul is trying to take us. When we let go of understanding, we finally come face to face with love. Think of Jesus' healing miracles. He made the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the sick were healed, the leprous were cleansed, the possessed were were exercised, and the dead were raised. Now, as soon as we hear those stories and we read those stories, our minds go into gear, and they are starting to process the details and the facts, and here we are fighting over them again. Did the miracles really happen? Were they true? How were they true? How did this all happen? What was the probability? What was the reality? And then we start wrestling with why we're not healed the way People were healed in Scripture, the way some others that we see in life are healed. And yet we pray, and we're faithful, and we're doing everything, and then we don't get healed. Does that mean God doesn't love us, doesn't approve of us like he loves others and approves of others? And all the turmoil that starts to happen as we think of this through our mind's eye, through our understanding. But, if we really love the book enough to seriously enter into a conversation, we start to realize that the primary purpose of Scripture is to express what a spiritual relationship in life looks like in a physical world. Do you see that? We live in a physical world. What does it look like to live spiritually while oh, we're still breathing here so that we can start to live that life and experience that life. What the scriptures are telling us is that the spiritual life begins the moment we begin to see and hear differently. The moment when we overcome the limitations of our traumas and our sicknesses and our oppression and the paralysis of fear and the disconnection and alienation that we feel, the spiritual deadness that creeps in. And we start walking we literally pick up our palate and we walk in new directions. Now, hear me. I'm not saying that this means that the, the miracles didn't literally happen. That's not the point. 
But the point is, is that the primary purpose of Scripture is to give us this new sight, to break us through into this new space with God. And so it layers up. When the blind see, it's us seeing with new sight. When the deaf hear, it's us able to hear truth from a direction that we never looked at before. When the lame walk, it's us having the courage, the assurance to rise above the fear that was paralyzing us before. All of these things are moving us. The miracles are not necessarily metaphorical, but this is something that is always available to us. Sometimes we're healed physically, and sometimes we're not, and I have no understanding and no answer to give you for why and neither does anybody else. But what we do know and what we have been promised is that if we ask, if we seek, we knock, nothing will separate us from God's love. And these things are always available. Jesus is giving us the healing that we really need, always giving us the healing we really need, even if it's not the one that we want at any given moment. And so to come back to Merton once more, what does he say? Thus, if we ask the Bible, as we ultimately must, when we enter into serious dialogue with it, who is this Father? What is meant by Father? Show us the Father. We, in our turn, are asked, in effect, who are you who seeks to know the Father? And what do you think you are seeking anyway? And we are told... Find yourself in love of your brother as if he were Christ, since in fact he is Christ, and you will know the Father. That is to say, if you live for others, you will have an intimate personal knowledge of the love that rises up in you out of a ground that lies beyond your own freedom and your own inclination, and yet is present as the very core of your own free and personal identity. Penetrating to that inner ground of love, you at last find your true self. We're people of the book. We need to own it. Really own that. It's time to own that and let the book be what the book is. Stop trying to make it into our own image and let it take us into that strange new world. It's life-changing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our book. Thank you for all the men and women over millennia who lived their lives in such a way that they had something to write about, something that has survived because it touched so many hearts, because it kept speaking to people generation after generation, century, millennia later. Thank you for our book, Lord. Help us to find a relationship with this book that will take us where you would like us to go in deeper communion with you and with each other. Help us to rise above the disturbance, to rise above the distraction, to rise above our fears. Help us to know we have permission to enter into conversation with our word in this very way. And thank you again, Father, for your abiding love that never leaves or forsakes so that we know as we do this, as we become disoriented, that we're never alone and that you're always with us every step of the way. Never let us forget, Father. We can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.